Imagine that you are one of the disciples in the first century. You're James or John or Peter or even the Apostle Paul, and you have to come up with a word to encapsulate for your Greek audience and the Greek world in which you live. You have to come up with a word that describes the essence of who Jesus is and who God is. Well, in our time together today, in this part two of our word series, we're going to discover that there was a very important word that the New Testament believers and authors had to bring into play in order to describe the beauty and the goodness and the wonder and the majesty of God's character. I have with me my friend, um, Nathan McKee, who has an interest in uh, the Greek language, specifically because of his interest in the New Testament. Nathan, again, welcome. And hey. uh, share with us just briefly again, why your interest in words in general and why your interest in the Greek language in particular. Yeah, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm very interested in words and, and their meanings and, and how between different languages, there's not a direct, you know, correlation between words sometimes. So you really have to dig into the meaning behind the words to really get at the definition. Because mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where Greek comes in to the New Testament uh, for me, is just being able to, to read a little bit the story behind the word. Um, and, and it's the, the fullness of its definition. Right, right. Yeah. So, so you know, words are the building blocks of sentences, uh, which are the building blocks of paragraphs, which are the building blocks of chapters and stories. Mm -hmm. Without words, um, we would be lost on the landscape of reality. <laughs> we mm -hmm. wouldn't know what to do or what to make, you know. That's right. We'd be you, gesturing yeah. at each other. Yeah, and, yeah. Sign language, yeah. which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but words have so much power, mm -hmm. don't they? I mean, Scripture itself, Nathan, says that God created the universe and our world with words. By the word of the Lord, Scripture says, that, that creation was brought into yeah. being. And, and we do the same thing in a lesser sense, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, God is the creator who literally created the world and the universe with words. Um, we're his creatures. We were made in his image. And we create new realities in one another's minds mm. with words. Like I formulate a sentence, mm -hmm. the, the simple sentence, hello, how are you? creates a sense in your mind of friendliness and interest on my part to which you can respond and say, well, actually I'm doing fine. Yeah. And so we've created um, a, a kind of connection or meaning with one another through the use of words and sentences and paragraphs. We build our whole lives with words. That's right. Um, it's the basis for how we communicate and connect with each other. Mm -hmm. And we affect each other that way. Like yeah. you said, words are powerful and words have history. They have history. They have meaning. So mm -hmm. what is the history of the word that we're looking at today? <laughs> our word in this part two of yeah. our seven part series on key words in the New Testament is the word agape. <laughs> agape. <laughs> agape. That's right. It's you knew word. that, Todd. <laughs> I knew that. Yeah. It's, the word, it's the word agape. Yeah. So, so, so take us to this word. Give us a little bit of the historical background. Yeah. Uh, why this word? It's a Greek word, and, and it shows up in the New Testament. Yeah. Why? Well, first, Ty, let me, let me put a proposition to you. So okay. what, how would you react to the, to the statement, love is meaning? I like it. I think, I think there's truth in that. I think that love, I would maybe add a word, love is the ultimate meaning. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I really like Victor Hugo and um, was mm. sharing to you a little bit my... Les Miserables. That's right, Les okay. Miserables. And, and my love of French kind of directs me in that direction. So here's one quote from him. To love or have loved, that is enough. Ask nothing further. There is no other pearl to be found in the dark folds of life. So poetic and beautiful. So that's, that's Victor Hugo. Yeah. On a similar note, a few months ago, I was, I was listening to a, um, a playlist of, of French popular songs. Okay. And I heard this one. It's called Quelqu'un m'a dit. What does which, that mean? Which means someone told me. Someone told me. Okay. And translated, some of the lyrics read like this. They tell me that our lives aren't worth much. 
They pass in an instant, just like a rose withers. They tell me that the slipping time is a jerk, that it makes, makes coats of our misery. Nonetheless, someone told me that you still loved me. Hmm. Someone told me that you still loved me. Could it be possible? And that's the meaning you were talking about. That's right. And, and so this song struck me because I'm like, wow. Here this, this artist, this, this, um, this woman is singing, starts out with a very pessimistic view of the world. Yeah. Pretty much meaning, you know, it's all meaningless. Yeah. Vanity of vanities. Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what's the point of all this suffering and, and, yeah. and time? And it just, it all ends in death anyway. But then you see a glimmer of hope yeah. that yet, forget about all that other stuff, someone loves me. Someone loves me. Tell me more about that. Isn't that incredible? So that immediately gave her meaning to hold yeah. on to despite yeah. all of this pessimism. Yeah, yeah. So, so all of us have human loves, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I love my wife. I love my children. They love me. <laughs> you, you have a wife and two children. You love them. Uh, there's all this love yeah. that is moving between human beings that gives meaning and significance to life. Um, what do you think of this idea? What do you think about the idea that all human love, all human love is derived from the love of God? Mm -hmm. That, that the, the reason why we as human beings love one another mm. ever so imperfectly is because there's a perfect love yeah. that, that birthed us into existence, created us. And so, so to, to love is to, in some sense, uh, experience God. And this mm. is what the New Testament says explicitly. That's right. Yeah, I like that idea, Ty, and I think, it's, I think it's biblical. But we have a problem, okay, what's the problem? in English with love. Uh -huh. The problem is this, Ty. What's it? I love my wife. <laughs> I love my children. Okay. I love pizza. I love tacos and yeah. skateboarding. <laughs> So, so now I need to do the hard work of, yeah. of, of sorting out the difference between yeah. pizza and your wife, Bethany. That's right. Yeah. Who I happen to know. I know your wife, and, and, and I know that she would not want yeah. to be on a par with pizza. Yeah, yeah. So, so does this mean that I, I put the same loving energy into my love of pizza that I do for my wife and children? Or what does this mean, Ty? It's confusing. It is confusing. In English. Yeah, yeah. There is a difference between my wife and tacos. <laughs> There's a yeah. difference between your wife and pizza. Yeah. We're, we're kind of limited with the English language, with the word love. We, yeah. have, a, we have a variation. We might, we might uh, catch ourselves and say, no, I don't love tacos. I like tacos, and uh -huh. I love my wife. So there, right. there would be a nuance of That's meaning true. that we, That's might, true. we might distinguish with. But yeah. we don't have a lot to work with yeah. uh, with the English language. Yeah, we're forced to gather from the context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so here is the text we'll begin with, and then we'll, we'll, we'll look at the word itself, the word agape. Notice this in 1 John 4, 8. I um, want to encourage all of you to get your Bibles and some kind of way to take notes. You'll see here I have my own little journal, and I wrote agape at the top of the page here, and I'm a note taker. I want to encourage you in some way, shape, or form to become a note taker. Um, I've known people over the years who say, oh, I don't really like taking notes. And so I've encouraged my students in class at times, okay, while I'm teaching, doodle. Draw pictures and diagrams of what you think I'm saying. Mm. And that's a, a way of taking notes as well. Um, but be a note taker. Capture the ideas that we're going to be unpacking during our time together. So in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, grab your Bible and open with us. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And that goes back to what we were saying, yeah. that, that yeah. all human love is approximating the higher and ultimate love of God as the source mm -hmm. and origin of all love. Now, the word here is agape. Yeah. And literally, the text is saying that, that if I don't love my fellow human beings, I can't possibly love God because I'm, 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 I'm living contrary mm. to the essence of God's character, and the mm -hmm. essence of God's character is love. God is love. Love. The word agape in the New Testament, here is a range of definitions that we, that we um, gained from our, our study of the Greek word agape. Mm -hmm. Agape means something like goodwill, benevolence, 
esteem. It also means to have preference for, to wish well to, or to regard the welfare of. And the idea here is, you know, there's me and there's you, and if I have agape for you, if I have agape quality love for you, then, then I prefer you mm-hmm. over myself. I, 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 I wish uh, well for you over myself. And then it even can take on the meaning of to have to take pleasure in a thing, to prize it mm-hmm. above other things, mm-hmm. like, you know, tacos and wife and, and children. Mm-hmm. Um, to be unwilling, this is amazing, to abandon it or to do without it. I mean, I'm willing wow. to yeah. abandon and do without tacos. I am not willing to abandon yeah. my wife. Yeah, right? and, and Christ is not willing to abandon the lost sheep. That's right. He goes after it. He goes after it. He pursues yeah. us. And so there's yeah. a basic definition, everybody, yeah. of the word agape. Yeah. Again, for the note takers, please, please, you know, just, just capture the ideas yeah. here because it's going to really yeah. make a lot of sense. So Ty, oh, yes. oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's going to make a lot of sense as you incorporate this word into your vocabulary. Um, expand your vocabulary. When you hear the word love now, think <laughs> in terms of agape and think in terms of goodwill and benevolence. Well, I was going to just mention, Ty, we mentioned words have history. Yes. Agape has a very fascinating history. Okay. So the use of, the biblical use of agape to say love is, is traced back to the authors or, or the translators mm-hmm. of the Septuagint. Okay. Which is the Greek version of the Old Testament that was drafted a few centuries before Christ. Mm-mm. So th- there was this group of, of Jewish scholars who knew, obviously, Hebrew and Greek quite well. Mm-hmm. And Greek was becoming the more fluent language of the Hellenistic Jewish community, which was now spread out more than just Israel, but there were Jews living in small communities throughout the Greek-speaking mm-hmm. world. And so they were translating the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek and trying to find words um, that matched up. Yeah. And when they got to love, they kind of had an issue right. because a lot of the other Greek words for love didn't quite, um, didn't quite do it. Right, right. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly how, how the scene happened, but, but they must have gone back and forth you know, yeah. debating with each other, what words should we use for love? Right. And they came up with agape. Agape. Um, in, and, con- in contrast to other Greek words. Exactly, in contrast to other Greek words. So, so this, is, this is what um, we're calling the, the love complex mm-hmm. in, in, uh, in the Greek language. And that is to say that, that <laughs> love is a multidimensional reality for the Greek mind. And so unlike English, where we just have the word love mm-hmm. and maybe the word like, um, in, in the Greek language, they had four words yeah. for love, and they were eros, phileo, storge, and agape. Now, it's interesting that in the first century, eros was in vogue, uh, phileo mm-hmm. was <clears throat> in vogue, storge was in vogue. People mm-hmm. were using these words. They were, you know, you'd, you'd hear that word, and it would be a common word. Eros is the word that was used in Greek language for like aesthetic love. Yeah. So, so yeah. It's, not, it's not limited mm-hmm. to eroticism yeah. or sexual attraction. Yeah. But it, it is includes a passionate that. love. It, yeah. It's a heart-thumping love. Yeah. So you would have eros for um, somebody that you're physically attracted mm-hmm. to, sexually attracted to, but you would also have eros for a beautifully prepared plate of food that has mm-hmm. an aroma or a painting, mm-hmm. or, or, a, or, or a sculpture, yeah. or a song. Yeah, the it's word a passionate Eros. or a sensual mm-hmm. love. By which we mean it appeals to the senses, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And then phileo is like friendship love, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and, and it could be a very, um, <clears throat> a very strong me. love. Mm. Yeah. But, 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 yeah, I mean, you, you, could, you could phileo your friends. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a way to express love between friends. In fact, in the, in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, we have uh, the Church of Philadelphia, mm-hmm. along with, you know, Ephesus and Pergamos and Laodicea. And, and the word phileo, Philadelphia, mm-hmm. is, is um, the word that means brotherly love. 
Um, the city of Philadelphia in the United States just means brotherly love. There's yeah. the word phileo. It's friendship love. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and phileo was, is probably the broadest um, word mm. for love yeah, in, in, yeah. in this list. Yeah, and yeah. then storge, what's that? Yeah, so storge is a little bit of, of a less common word, mm -hmm. and storge is, is pretty much limited in its meaning to uh, familial love. So the love between... Family. That's right, mm -hmm. family. The love between a parent and a child, right. or between a child and a parent. Um, right. it, it was maybe, used, for, maybe for weird Uncle Bob as well, who comes yeah. only around on Thanksgiving or Christmas. Yeah, yeah, he's he's weird, but he he's ours. He's you know? ours. So, yeah. So, so we store gay him. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, we store gay him because he's ours. Yeah, he's ours, yeah. and we love him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we love him. Yeah. Um, but then the word agape, <laughs> first century, as best we can tell from the reading I've done. The word agape was not in in common use. It wasn't yeah. it wasn't just being thrown around yeah. left, right, and it's, center. It, it's not this super common word. And again, going back to the Septuagint, when they were finding ways of of describing God's love, when mm. they were translating the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek, they chose agape because it was disused. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, it, or, or out of use. Yeah. So it, it was this kind of obscure, lesser known, lesser used word for love that didn't have all this baggage that the right. other ones had. So, you know, you think of eros, well, you know, that's the root of our word for erotic. And so, the, you know, that doesn't, that has that connotation to it. We can't use that for God's love. Mm. Phileo didn't quite fit it for them. Storge, so, so, so they, they wound up with agape. Yeah, so if you're John, if you're Peter, if you're Paul, and you're, you're you know, hunting your vocabulary mm -hmm. or the Greek vocabulary for a word, <laughs> It was really an ingenious move yeah. to, to take a word that was not in common use and then to employ it yeah. and to infuse it with meaning. I mean, really, it was, it was a word that was like a piece of clay that mm -hmm. they, could, they could shape into. Yeah. And they said, God is agape. Yeah. It God was a blank slate for them. Yes. Um, and of course, they could look back to the, to the Greek Old Testament, the mm. Septuagint, and, and see it being used there and carry that idea forward into yeah, yeah. the New Testament as well. So, so when the New Testament writer said, God is love, mm -hmm. it's really in, interesting to, to, to notice that they're doing something here um, that, is, that is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not saying that, that God is love among other things. Mm -hmm. They're saying God is love in totality. That's what and who God is. God is love. In, in our modern use of the word love, we've, we've kind of reduced it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the word is fill, filled with, 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 you know, Paul McCartney wrote the lyric, the world, the, the world is filled with silly love songs. Mm. Well, God's love isn't silly. Yeah. And, and it's not merely the way that love songs are used today, mm -hmm. where you, you listen to, to you know, uh, an album of modern popular music and track one, I love you, baby, because you're beautiful. Mm -hmm. Not because there's something about me, mm -hmm. but because there's something about you. So I love you because you're attractive, right? Mm -hmm. By track three, I don't love you, baby, anymore mm -hmm. because I found some other person that I'm more attracted to. Mm -hmm. So I've abandoned you for someone else mm. because you yeah. aren't sufficiently meeting my needs. Yeah. So if I love you because mm -hmm. of what you do for me, that's not agape. That's not yeah. God's love. That's, that's selfish. It. Yeah, and, and, and you could <clears throat> probably describe that as eros love. Eros. That's more, that's more like eros, exactly. Yeah. That's aesthetic love, the love of attraction, and that type mm -hmm. of thing. And the passion dries up, and so does the love. So does the love. That's right. So, so... When the Bible says God is love, um, I'd like to suggest that this is a statement, a declaration that encompasses everything that is true of God. So I'll say it this way. Everything that is true of God is true of God because God is love. So we don't need to, to distinguish between, for example, love and justice mm -hmm. because justice is a dimension of God's love. Mm -hmm. it's, not like, it's not like when God executes judgment or mm -hmm. is just that he's breaking ranks with mm -hmm. his love to be something <clears throat> other than love. Mm -hmm. Rather, the truth of the matter is that God is agape, God is love, and therefore God is merciful and just and patient and kind mm -hmm. and compassionate. 
everything that is true of God mm -hmm. falls under the heading, God is love. Yeah. God is love. Yeah, Ty, that's, that's such a powerful concept because, you know, a lot of times, like you said, people kind of force this dichotomy. Right. He's, you know, he's either loving or judgmental. Right. It's like, no, he judges because he's loving. Yeah. In the same way that as a parent, you discipline your child because you love them. Exactly. You know, yeah. if you didn't love them, you would just let them get away with anything and wouldn't teach them right, right from wrong um, and, and let them bear the consequences of that. And they'd get hurt. Yeah, and, and they'd get hurt. Right. Um, but because you love them, you do the hard thing, yeah. which is to discipline them. Sometimes, uh, what what is the... There's a term for that, tough love. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Not abusive love, love but it's no. tough love. It's like, oh, there's a line here, mm -hmm. and you, yeah. my little friend, my child, my son, my daughter, mm -hmm. may not cross this line. Yeah. Daddy, you don't love me. Yeah. No, I do love you, yeah. and that is precisely why mm -hmm. I've created this line that you can't cross yeah. because there's danger yeah. over here that I don't want you to be exposed yeah. to. And guess what? The easy thing to do would be not to create that line and not to establish anything. Yeah, That'd which be would be thing. very unloving. And it would be unloving. It in would a be way. unloving. Yeah. That's right. So, okay, let's throw another idea on the table. Um, and, and that is that um, Eros is a kind of love mm. that loves the beautiful. I've kind of mentioned that mm -hmm. already in the sense yeah. that, you know, with modern pop music, the, the idea is very, very sentimental and, it, and it's, very, it's very much oriented toward what I derive from what you bring to the table. Mm. It ignores my part of the relational dynamic mm -hmm. where, for example, in marriage vows, you know, in sickness and health. Well, do I love you even mm -hmm. when you're sick as well as healthy? For richer or for poorer, we're, we're, we, we have money and things are easy and I love you, but if we're flat broke, do I still love you? Mm -hmm. Do the stresses of life compromise my love in, in this relationship? So Eros loves the beautiful, the beautiful mm -hmm. plate of food, the beautiful work of art, the beautiful song, the beautiful human, right? But agape is different. And this is, this is to me just a remarkable idea. Agape beautifies the beloved. Mm. So, so, so God loves me and God loves you even when we're not morally beautiful, when we're, when we're yet yeah. sinners. While Christ we were still sinners. While we were still sinners, Romans 5. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. So God's love, how, okay, let me say it this way. God's love defines who he is, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Who he is consistently regardless of the external circumstances of human failure, human defects, human sin, right? And then God's love, which is lavished upon mm -hmm. me, even though I am unlovely, even though I'm not beautiful, even though I am a sinner and I fall short of the glory of God, the goodness of God, God loves me. And then that love has the effect mm of drawing me into its vortex so that I, became, I begin to want to be like the one who loves me. So that's what I mean when I say that, that agape beautifies the beloved. Mm -hmm. If there's something wrong with me, mm -hmm. God is going to love me out yeah. of it. His, his love mm -hmm. turns us into the person that we're supposed to be. That oh, we're always that. meant that to is be. So, I love that. And, I like that. In an that. unfallen way. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and his love is loving us into that. Yeah. He, he, his love, say it again, turns us in to, to who we were meant, meant to, be. to be. Yeah. Isn't that something? I mean, it's a powerful influence yeah. then. Oh, yeah. And, and the only way it could be that powerful is if it is consistent in God. Mm hmm rather than something that's fickle, like yeah. up and down and yeah. in and I love you today, I mm -hmm. don't love you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. God's love is constant. It's, it's the truth about him, yes. regardless yeah. of any external uh, conditions or yeah. circumstances. That, that's exactly right, Ty. And in, in, in a way, God's love is a, a faucet, if I can call it that, that's, that's never turned off. It's on full blast. All the time. All the time. It's just pouring, pouring. And Regardless of our actions, mm -hmm. it's still pouring into it. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, Nathan, you were pretty good today. God loves you.
Nathan, you messed up today. Guess what? God loves you. And yeah. he, he pours that love into you nonetheless. Yeah. And, and it changes us. It's constant. From it's the constant. heart outward. And that brings us, the constancy of it brings us to the Hebrew background to the word agape. You, you hinted at this earlier where you suggested that there was the Hebrew mm-hmm. Old Testament concept of love. And when the, uh, when the New Testament authors um, needed to find a word to approximate the, the love of God, the, the word in the Hebrew was hesed. Okay. Hesed. Hesed is covenantal love. It's constant love. It's faithful love. It's described, for example, in Isaiah 54 and verse 10, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing mm. love, those two words, unfailing love, are the single Hebrew word hesed. Mm. My unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed. So there's the idea that all of nature could implode or, or you know, mountains shaken and mm. hills being moved. But God says, no matter what happens, I will never, ever stop loving you. Wow. And then mm. Isaiah 42 verse 6 is a prophecy. It's a messianic prophecy of the coming Messiah, the Savior. I, the Lord, have called you, that's God the Father, I have Mm -hmm. called you the Son, Jesus, in righteousness, and I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant Mm. to the people. Again, the idea that the Old Testament idea of the Mm -hmm. love of God is his said or Mm -hmm. covenantal Faithfulness. Mm, okay, so Constancy. in that passage, it's, it's covenant that uh, is Hesed. No, covenant is not Hesed here. Oh, okay. I'm, yeah, the, 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 that's actually Bereith in the okay. Hebrew. But I'm simply pointing out mm-hmm. that in the previous text yeah. that we looked at, um, my unfailing love is equivalent to covenant. Okay, got um, it. Yes. Yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor mm-hmm. my covenant, nor my covenant of peace be removed, right? So then the prophecy mm-hmm. is God's covenantal faithfulness mm-hmm. his his said mm. is going to take on living form in the messiah in the person of christ when jesus comes into the world he is going to be the covenantal love of god embodied this is this is the transition between the old testament and the new so mm. bring us to the new testament then yeah i mean so so i mean one of the most common verses that we all memorize is john three sixteen. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for God so loved the world, that's agape, Mm. that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that's describing what agape is, what the love of God is like. It's giving your only son. It's giving up your life. So so one of the characteristics, as you're pointing out, is giving Mm -hmm. or generosity. Um, God, we might say, is other-centered and self-sacrificing, because when it says here he gave his only begotten Mm, son, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot there. He's giving Jesus to the world. He's not lending Mm -hmm. Jesus to the world. He's giving Jesus to the world. There's a whole big theological, you know, door that Mm -hmm. opens into that idea that according to the New Testament, God gave his son permanently to the human race Mm. to be a member of the human race so that according to the apostle paul in ephesians and in colossians and philippians as well as in the book of hebrews we have this idea that even after his his death burial and resurrection and ascension jesus bears our humanity he is our brother in the flesh for eternity so 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 he was given to the human race in the yeah. sense that he was given as a member of the human race forever and yeah. ever. And Nathan. that's what makes him the perfect mediator for us. Yeah. It's he incredible. understands us. In what the, a sacrifice. In, in the deepest level, he understands yeah. us. So that's agape. Mm-hmm. Agape is, is self-sacrificing mm-hmm. love. It's love that mm-hmm. gives. It's generous. God didn't withhold. One author says it this way. I remember reading um, a line that says that that. Um, all of heaven was given in the gift of God's son. So Jesus, mm. Jesus is the one in whom mm-hmm. God gives everything to the human race. All the resources of heaven are put at the disposal of human salvation mm-hmm. in the person of Christ. 
Um, okay, so in the next verse, verse 17, there's another characteristic of, of this agape love. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So, so in verse 16, God's love is characterized by giving, giving in the ultimate mm -hmm. sense of self-sacrifice. Here, God's love is, is characterized by a lack of condemnation. Mm. So we might, we might say God's love is non-condemning, mm. non-condemning love. Um, and this is important to understand because, again, we're not dealing with eros here. Mm -hmm. We're not dealing with a, a love that is on one moment mm. and off yeah. the next moment. And a, a love that's like, I love you because. Of okay, this. that's a great or way of saying I don't love yeah. you because. Yeah, yeah. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah. So get your act together and then come and see me. Mm -hmm. No, I love you before you get your act together, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm, I'm relating to you without condemnation. Now that is not to say God is blind to our, mm -hmm. our sins. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not fiction. It's not play acting. He's not like pretending like we've not done anything wrong. Yeah. He knows we're sinners, Yeah. but he loves us still. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's and just his tremendous. intention is to love us out of that state. Yeah, there we are again with the yeah. idea that that the love of God, the agape of God, um, elevates us. It mm. beautifies us. It transforms us. Or, or as you said, it makes us into mm -hmm. the kind of people we were meant That's right. to be. That's right, because Ty, we were created in the image of God. Which is love. Which is love. Yes. And and. and Things went terribly wrong, and we fell. Um, but through God's love, mm. God is wanting to turn us into his image bearers to the world. Yeah. And not only our hearts are changed, but we start to affect others around us in a positive way yeah. with that, God's love. It's kind of like a cascading effect, yeah. like a trickle effect, where, yeah. where God loves me and I realize it. Mm -hmm. And then as I realize God's love for me, I don't, I don't make God love me by my realization. I just see it finally. Yeah. And then I begin to relate to those around me in the way that God has related to me. And they begin to see God's mm -hmm. love and experience God's yeah. love through a human medium, through a human agent. And then that deflects from me to him. That's right. So then they begin to love God as the source of mm -hmm. that, that love. Okay. So then, so then what we're suggesting is that Jesus embodies the agape of love. In our previous session, we said that, that Jesus is the embodiment of the logos of God, right? The, mm -hmm. the operating system of reality, the logic and rational process mm -hmm. uh, of, of reality. Now we're suggesting, well, the New Testament is explicitly telling mm -hmm. us, that Jesus is the embodiment of the agape love of of God. And that's why mm. when we see Jesus, yeah. his love is on display as a love that is constant, a love that is non-condemning, a love that is full throttle. Like, like you said, the faucet is yeah. open yeah. all the way and it's just gushing yeah. out. And, yeah. and there's, no, there, there's no hesitancy mm -hmm. on, on God's part. Jesus embodies God's love. So Nathan, let's go through a, a little bit of a longer passage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, starting okay. with verse 7, and we'll, we'll not look at every single verse, yeah. but here's how the New Testament, again, for those of you who are joining <clears throat> us, um, uh, I would encourage you to take notes on, on this passage because there's so much richness here. You'll want, to, you'll want to capture some of these ideas so that you can share them in the future with friends and family. So starting with uh, 1 John chapter 4, uh, to begin with, verses 7 and 8, Nathan. Okay. So, beloved, let us one, uh, excuse me, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So, all of the words for love there are agape again. That's right. And That's right. essentially, what John is saying here is that. Love for one another, love for fellow human beings, right, mm -hmm. is a manifestation of the love of God. Yeah. I mean, th the fact is, our, our, our horizontal love 
reveals the fact that we're partakers of, of God's love on the, the vertical level. Then verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God in, abides in us. That's quite a bridge of understanding yeah. there. If we love one another, that's evidence, that's proof mm -hmm. that God is abiding, living in us, and his love has been perfected or, or matured um, in us. It's not flawless, of mm. course. We're fallen human beings, and yeah. we, we make mistakes, and we come short of God's agape. But, but we're in a maturation process as we partake of God's love for us, where his love is being matured mm. um, right. in us. And then verse 13. How about that one, Nathan? Yeah, so 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And verse 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. And verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And finally, verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. This, is, this, is, this has to be one of the most powerful passages. It, it makes all the connections between God and love and us, and yeah. God being love. Yeah, yeah. So God, God is love. And if you live in love, you live in God, and God lives in you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 yeah. it's poetic the way that, yeah. that, that it's uh, worded even in the English. But again, we're dealing with the idea here of a love that is first and foremost in God. Mm -hmm. And that love that is in God is, is the, the birthplace of human creation. Mm. I mean, we could, we could even say, according to this passage and in many other passages, because God is love, God created the world mm. and human beings to be image bearers, reflectors of his love, because love has a, a, a other-centered quality. Mm, that's right. So if it has an other-centered quality, you know, for example, you and Bethany fell in love. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a logical, natural next step to want to replicate mm -hmm. your love by having children that you can lavish yeah. your love upon yeah. and can be not only the, 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 the recipients of your love, but then you can watch your own little ones love each other and love you back. And it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And the whole universe was made for this. Yeah. The love, world. Love isn't satisfied just to be alone. Love wants to give and receive. Yeah, yeah. You know, God, God created us because he wanted something to love. Yeah, yeah. And, and when, we, when we love, John says, that's the evidence that's the evidence. In this same passage, we didn't read this verse specifically. It said, if I hate my brother, I'm lying. If, if I say I love God, but I hate my brother, mm -hmm. I'm lying. Yeah. I mean, it's a very simple equation. Yeah. You know, God, I love you. You know, I'm, 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 I'm religious and I worship you and I'm going through the motions of religion, but I hate my fellow human being. God, God says, no, if you say you love me, that will manifest itself in love for your fellow human beings. That's right. If you have God in your heart, you have love in your heart, yes, by definition. Yeah, yeah. And this love, this love that is the very essence of the character of God, um, reached its pinnacle revelation in the person of Jesus Christ. And finally, our fellow Bible students at the cross of Calvary, so when John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, well, that giving didn't have any limits. He gave Jesus to us as the fallen human race, and we turned on him, and we crucified him, and he yielded to our abuse and to our murderous sinful, evil, wicked intentions. And when Jesus died on the cross without retaliating, he was revealing in the most beautiful and crystal clear sense that God, when push comes to shove, loves all others above and before himself. Amen.
for God so deeply, so passionately, so completely, so perfectly, so selflessly loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for the human race. Amen. When we get together next time, we're going to be looking at the third word in our seven-part series on key New Testament words. That third word that we're going to be looking at in the series is the Greek word sozo. So if you want to do a little bit of homework and investigation yourself, take some notes, you can be prepared for our next time together as we look at the Greek word sozo, which you will find as the English word saved and salvation in the New Testament. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to being with you again.